Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining uh, today. Uh, my name is Reverend Bud Heckman. I serve as the Vice President for the Religion Communicators Council uh, nationally. Um, we're an organization that's existed for rounding towards a century now, uh, but helping people who are in faith-based, faith-inspired organizations think more effectively about how it is that they uh, communicate. Uh, providing professional development experiences. Uh, this webinar today is one of the many things we do, including providing resources, having uh, meetings and gatherings locally and nationally um, to help advance uh, the purpose of faith-based uh, communications. We have a uh, annual convention next year, which I encourage you to put on your calendar in Chicago, which is March 30th to April 1st at the Rosemont Crown Plaza near O'Hare Airport. Um, today, we're very, very privileged to have with us someone who has uh, one of the top brand uh, and culture experts uh, in the nonprofit business, a woman who has served at the largest uh, museum, the Met, uh, most recently here in New York City, and then um, before that had served um, the patient's branding at uh, the United Way Worldwide. And that is uh, Cynthia uh, Round. Uh, Cynthia is uh, someone who's been known to me for a long period of time, and sometimes the best resources are right underneath your nose. I was uh, very delighted to see that she had a moment to be able to spend with us and share some about what her experiences are. Uh, today, she's going to talk about um, brand strategy as a sort of method to create uh, social change and share some of the experiences that she's had from the corporate world and then from the nonprofit world in terms of trying to advance that. Uh, she has a, quite a, a resume and experience of making presentations in a wide variety of um, fora uh, and is, uh, on the, serves on the board of Oklahoma State University um, Foundation as well as volunteers with a number of different uh, organizations. I'm a big uh, fan of uh, Cynthia and uh, used to have the privilege of seeing her occasionally as we both commuted down to Washington, D.C., uh, when she was doing work with the United Way and I was doing work with the El Hebrew Foundation uh, and see each other uh, along the way um, out to our, our, our suburb of Washington, D.C., as we like to think of it here in New York City. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm gonna be muting several of you as you join on just to try to eliminate the background noise. There is a chat feature that is included at the bottom of the computer-based uh, way of joining in on today's Zoom call. And I encourage you to post questions there, make comments there as we go along. Uh, Cynthia is gonna begin with her presentation, the initial slide's already up here, um, and say a little bit about herself and so forth in just a moment. Um, but as we go along, as you're muted, uh, you can add in questions in the chat box and we'll go to an open Q&A after she's finished uh, with her presentation. If you would like to learn more about the Religion Communicators Council, if you're coming as a guest today, um, it's a very friendly uh, professional development uh, association that's been in existence uh, for about nine decades. You can find more online at religioncommunicators.org. Uh, There's a lot of benefits uh, to joining and being a member. I've enjoyed uh, participating in it for a number of years now, and I'm very uh, pleased to serve um, in the capacity that I do as the vice president. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Cynthia Round and turn it over to her for now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bud. I'm really delighted to have this opportunity for a discussion with you and, uh, and the group today. Um, after two decades, you alluded to this, but after two decades uh, uh, in the business world, uh, building brands uh, for Procter & Gamble and for Ogilvy and made their advertising, it became my personal mission to use, uh, to take what I had learned and to use that experience and that expertise to see if we could uh, create more, uh, more, more good in the world, more social good. So it's kind of my personal, uh, personal mission. Um, if the business world can create an almost cult-like following uh, for a brand of running shoes like Nike or a set of coffee shops like Starbucks, then surely we can use the same principles, the same strategies to inspire people to make better choices for healthy living, um, to ensure that every child has the education uh, that uh, he and she deserves, um, or to change our behavior in order to save our planet. So um, the starting point that I want to you know, begin with today is sort of what can we learn 
from the great brands. And I'm starting here with Coca-Cola because for three decades, Coca-Cola was the reigning number one most valuable brand in the world, um, as uh, rated uh, in the annual report done by Interbrand, ranking the top 100 most valuable brands. This is not about the value of the company per se, it's about the ability of the brand to attract revenue. And so, as I said, Coca-Cola sat in that top spot for three decades, and only two years ago, was displaced with this uh, famous uh, and iconic brand. It probably doesn't surprise any of you now to, uh, to know that Apple is um, evaluated now as the single most uh, valuable brand in the world at $173 billion. Um, and so the question is, what can we learn from brands like these two, like Nike, like Starbucks, that have been so incredibly successful at inspiring um, not just not, not just attracting revenue, but our interest in them is how they inspire such incredible loyalty and passion. Uh, the first thing that they understand well is that a brand is more than a logo, a trademark, or a tagline. It's not really about image. That's a piece of it. Uh, in fact, I even like to go further to say just because you have a name and a logo and a trademark doesn't make you a brand because brand status is something that is earned. We don't actually own our brands. We, we co-own them with the users who are the ones that give brands value. And we always have to remember that. And in fact, I think the most important and significant question that you can ever ask and answer is how is this brand significant in the lives of its users? It seems like a simple question, but this then goes way beyond, you know, product or service performance. Um, this is now moving into the area of the intangibles and the emotional terrain, which is really how the best brand, that's the, that's the space that the best brands operate in and that secret that they know. And the important thing about this question is that if you ask and understand this among your most loyal users, in this case, whether those are donors or members or congregation, however you're defining those people who use your brand. If you can understand this question of what drives that positive relationship, then you can replicate that relationship many times over. So we're gonna come back to this question, um, but uh, the, the long and short of it is that I really define a brand as a relationship. Nothing more, nothing less. And, and, and I like to say to nonprofits who often don't feel that they are expert or know a lot about building brands, that if you know how to build a human relationship, you know how to build a brand relationship. Um, and of course, uh, it's, it's that simple, but of course we all know that, that building human relationships can be also very complex. So it's both simple, it's a simple idea, but it's complex to actually pull off successfully. These four um, basic tenets are the cornerstones of any good relationship, any good brand relationship, or for that matter, any human relationship. Um, it starts with trust. That is the foundation, the bedrock upon which any relationship is, is based. Without trust, you have nothing and you can't go forward in the relationship. Authenticity is the second. And though authenticity is written about a lot and it may almost be overexposed and devalued in, in, a, in a way as a concept. It actually is very critical to this idea that even if you are going to try to take a, an existing brand uh, and renovate or revive it, um, you still have to authentically be who you are. Um, that's most critical. And then consistency, consistency over time, but also consistency between your words and your actions. If you say one thing and you do something else, it's not a good way to build a relationship, as you know from your human relationships. And then the final one is reciprocity. It must be two-way, it must be interactive. Um, there are a reason that we human beings are given two ears and one mouth, we should spend more time listening, and it's also true of a brand that you really have to listen as much as you talk in the relationship with your users. So with these sort of basic ideas, I'm going to um, illustrate them with um, an example. It happens to be my favorite example because, as you mentioned, it was my great privilege to serve as the Executive Vice President of Brand Strategy and Marketing for United Way Worldwide for more than a decade. 
Uh, in case some of you are not so familiar with United Way, um, it is the largest privately funded nonprofit in the world, uh, raising over $5 billion a year. It's been around for more than 130 years, uh, started in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it is comprised of a network, an interdependent network of 200 local United Ways, community-based United Ways in the U.S., and 1,800 worldwide across 40 countries. And very importantly, United Way's great strength is its partnership with 120 multinational corporations. And in fact, those of you who have had an experience with United Way, it's probably been in the workplace campaign because this was the incredibly uh, efficient and effective fundraising strategy that was created in the 50s by United Way. Um, and uh, gets a little bit at the heart of what I wanna talk about, um, uh, about the brand challenge a decade ago as we started to look at it. Um, one of the things uh, that United Way was starting to examine its business model because despite the ongoing generosity of Americans and the fact that our philanthropic giving continues to rise, we can all look around and pretty much say that our social problems are not getting a lot better. In fact, many of them are going the wrong direction. And if, like United Way, you are in the business of improving lives, it meant that, um, that uh, we needed to step back and take a look at the business model because these are problems, you can't fundraise your way out of these problems. It takes a great deal more than that in terms of government, business, and nonprofit sector working together to create change. So a, a, de a decade ago, the United Way was looking at the business model and moving from a fundraising fund distribution model to one of, of community impact and really trying to bring those three legs of the stool together of government, business, and nonprofits and try to create um, uh, create strategies that would actually uh, lead to change. Um, so that's the backdrop of the business model. So the brand challenge that we were also facing, our research indicated that even among those who were loyal donors, there were two primary issues. One was that they couldn't really tell you what United Way did. If we asked them, they would say good things. Um, there was trust there and they were continuing to give money, but they couldn't articulate how their money was being used and what it was being used for. And the second challenge was because most of them uh, in their relationship with United Way is through the workplace, through workplace giving, United Way was a somewhat distant and impersonal relationship for people. And this in a backdrop, this is a big challenge in a backdrop where um, particularly with millennials, but overall, uh, donors and volunteers are demanding a return on the investment. They want to know what difference their gifts are making. Um, and they also have a great deal of passion around their causes. Uh, we know in the portfolio of giving, people will tend to give to a place of faith, to their college or uh, school alma mater, uh, to a an organization, a health organization that's improved their lives. Um, and so giving to the community and giving to solve larger issues had to be something that was far more uh, passionate to people. And so those were the two brand challenges that we were facing. Um, since I mentioned that United Way is in the business of solving, uh, of, of improving lives, I wanted to just talk for a moment about, um, uh, about the two views of how we improve lives in this country. Um, uh, one of them is, uh, you know, the land of opportunity in America. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, we climb the ladder, and we sort of make it happen for ourselves. And that's how we improve the li our lives and the lives of our family. And there's a great history in this country of people doing that. The other view is one of, of helping those who need, uh, need that help, of a hand up or a hand out. And that's, of course, the basis for a lot of most charitable uh, giving is this sort of inclination um, to try to help and take care of others. The problem with this historical model is that it tends to be a bit divisive. It places us, it divides us into two camps, the haves and the have-nots. And, um, and, and this is a bit of a challenge. But as we talked to passionate United Way supporters, we understood that they had a different view because of their relationship with United Way. And what they felt that United Way was helping them do was um, 
was an, a, a view of interdependence, that we approve lives by being interdependent, that it is about the collective or the common good, and that when one of us is weak, we are all weak, we are all stronger together. And so this became the answer for United Way of how we were significant in the lives of people who really felt strongly about United Way and supporting it. And we then decided that we would um, take that as the brand idea um, into, uh, into driving uh, this new uh, business uh, model. It required us to relook at vision and mission. Um, so you see here um, the United Way envisioning a world where all individuals and families achieve their human potential. The important thing is we added specificity around education, income stability, and health as the three building blocks for a good life and said we will focus our work, we will use strategies to drive change in those areas. The mission remained to improve lives by mobilizing the caring power of community, but we added this idea of advancing the common or the collective good as the way of doing that because we learned that from our, from our um, uh, important uh, loyal uh, supporters. And then the brand idea off of that was about advancing the common good, but very importantly, this is about change, not charity, and that we wanted that to be the touchstone and the driving idea of United Way. Of course, the thing about change is that it's difficult. Those of you who are in the, the change business, the social change business, and we know that really nothing ever changes until somebody motivates a critical mass of the right people to commit to that change. So change and social change is particularly hard. We set out to then to create uh, a movement around the idea of creating change. Um, we called it the Live United Movement. And I won't read this to you. This was sort of our, our, our credo, our mission, our mission um, uh, statement around the campaign. Um, the idea that when we think of individuals outside ourselves, we have the power to create change. When we think of their lives linked to our own, our compassion grows. And that we can change the lives of those who walk around us every day. Um, the important part of this was not only the notion or the, uh, the concept to live united, but to also provide a call of action. So to give, to advocate, to volunteer. Um, and it would be a campaign then, uh, a movement uh, about the power of unity. Uh, we started by launching uh, or announcing three national goals. We called it the Challenge to America, knowing of course that United Way was never gonna be able to achieve these things uh, alone. This was gonna take um, all of us working together across the nonprofit uh, sector, the business uh, world um, uh, um, and government. Um, and we declared three national goals looking 10 years out around high school graduation, around financial stability in families, and around healthy lives for young people and adults. Um, we also expanded the ways in which people could support. Yes, it was gonna take money, we were asking for money, we would ask people to give, but to also advocate and to lend their voice as a champion for the causes of education, income, and health, and to volunteer time. And I think perhaps the most important insight that we had was that this even though the brand idea for United Way was cha would be change, not charity, it was not going to be a campaign about how United Way was creating change, but rather to inspire everyone to see themselves as part of the change, to become part of a movement to create that change. We had advertising, of course. Um, um, our website was overhauled, uh, social media, communications of all types and touch points um, with this kind of example uh, of how to live united, to think uh, we before me, reach out a uh, hand to one and influence the condition of all. So again, coming back to this notion of advancing the common good. Uh, we also needed to create an experience. It was going to be much bigger than communications. It always is. A brand is about a 360 degree experience, a surrounding experience. And so we created this, we borrowed the Rubik's Cube um, uh, and created this kind of mnemonic device for ourselves in, in terms of the kind of experience we wanted to create. We wanted every touch point with a donor or a volunteer to be about the work, about education, income, and health and the, and the goals that we were trying collectively to achieve. We wanted to make every communication a touch point and ask to either give or to lend your voice in advocacy or to volunteer. And then back to this idea of a relationship, since we knew that people didn't really understand or know how their money was being used, how it was being effective um, uh, through United Way, we wanted to build the relationship where we not only would ask 
in every communication, them to involve themselves and to see themselves as changing in some way, but to thank them for what they were doing and importantly to inform them on the difference that their work was already making in education, income, and health. Um, and it uh, took off as a movement. Um, I'm very uh, happy to say we really were able to ignite a movement uh, with 10 million donors and two and a half million uh, volunteers. We started a Student United Way movement. We, in the first two years, we went to um, 80 college campuses and began student-led United Ways on those campuses. Um, we were mobilizing a powerful movement of women across this country um, who were raising $150 million a year in support of education, income, and health as part of the Women's Leadership Council. And so it was quite a successful um, movement. We began to see the needle move. Again, the goals we'd set were 10-year goals, but we began to see the needle move on graduation rates improving, on health outcomes, particularly for teenagers around teen pregnancy and healthy choices um, beginning, to, beginning to move. And of course, these things will take time and will be tracked over time. Uh, we also took it globally. Uh, the idea of Live United, and we knew this from early research, was truly a, a, an idea without borders. It was not a based in a particular culture. Um, we went first to Latin and South America, and it was thanks very much to the, um, to frankly, to the Christian and the Catholic ethos of those, of those countries that really embraced this idea of the collective common good. Um, we saw it in Africa around the idea of Ubuntu and around the concept in Europe of unité. And so we really were able to take this idea um, globally. Uh, when I left, it was, uh, which was uh, three years ago, when I left United Way, we were um, in 17 countries and still expanding the idea of Live United um, and, uh, and beginning to create that social change. Uh, and I just wanna uh, make one other comment about it from a brand point of view. Um, after we'd launched the campaign and got it going for a couple of years, um, uh, Forbes uh, published their, uh, their list of the top 100 global brands. And for the first and only time, a, a nonprofit made that list and United Way made the list of the top, not just the top 100, but the top 50 most valuable brands in the number 26 spot. And so I think it's a testament to the use of these kinds of strategies and that we can build very powerful and global brands. Um, and I've been talking here about how to do that uh, initially for a product or a service. And this has been around an institution, but you can also take those same concepts of building a relationship and the principles of brand building around an idea, not just associated with one particular institution. And the Ad Council has been doing that for 75 years, um, trying to change behavior um, through communication, through the principles of brand. And I wanna just very quickly talk about three of their classic examples, because I think this is a very important idea that you can brand an idea or a concept as much as you can an institution or a product or a service. So the first one I'll start with is the seatbelts campaign, buckle up. Um, though US car manufacturers have been including seatbelts in cars since the 60s, uh, as recently as 1985, only 20% of Americans were actually buckling up. And so the US Department of Transportation came to the uh, Ad Council and asked for their help. And they created together what has become an iconic campaign, um, probably familiar to many of you, um, uh, Vince and Eddie, the crash test dummies. It was a campaign done with humor, um, but uh, it was um, to try to drive change and not just awareness, but to really create the behavior change of buckling up. Um, over the 20 years of that campaign's existence, they moved the needle on this from 20% to 71% of people buckling up or claiming to buckle up every time they got in the car. And now, of course, 49 countries, in 49 countries, it's, a, it's legally required, uh, 49 states. I don't actually know what one state doesn't require you to buckle up, but apparently there's one that, that hasn't done it, but 49 have. So that's how you can brand kind of an idea or a concept. Um, another one that I think is very powerful um, is the, uh, the drunk driving campaign. Um, you know, we see staggering uh, number of deaths on our highways, 18,000 a year. In fact, uh, there is a person in this country killed every 32 seconds um, in some uh, car related, an accident related to, uh, to, to alcohol consumption. So this is, uh, it continues to be a major challenge. Um, but the, 
the brilliance of the campaign that the Ad Council created was to target not the drinker driver, but the person in the situation whose, whose judgment was not impaired, the person who could prevent the accident by taking away the keys and creating a new social norm around that. Branding really this as a social accept, socially acceptable idea that friends don't let friends drive drunk and that we will take action. And since that time, in their research, that council has, um, evident, has evidence that 68% of people say that they personally have taken action to try to prevent someone from driving drunk. Um, and um, this, of course, is saving many, many lives. Um, the last campaign that I want to talk about is adoption uh, from foster care. Uh, there are 415,000 children in foster care in the United States, and 108,000 of them are waiting to be adopted by families. Um, and 33,000 of those are teenagers, and teenagers are particularly difficult to place because of their age. So this campaign was created by the Ad Council um, because they learned that the issue for most potential adoptive families was not the willingness or the motivation to take in a child. It, what they needed to create was not motivation, but permission. And so this campaign, again, employing humor around the idea that you don't have to be perfect to be the perfect parent for a kid who really needs you. Um, and uh, uh, the last data that I have on this was, uh, was from 2004. So I'm sure that uh, it has continued and gotten even better results. But at that, in that particular year, they had 218,000 inquiries to their website about becoming adoptive parents, and they actually placed 17,000 more children in adoptive homes through the campaign. Um, and so I wanted to just share those as examples because I think it's important um, that we tend to think more about brand principles uh, of, uh, you know, around an institution when we're in the nonprofit sector, but you can actually brand these ideas. We've seen two other very uh, uh, successful campaigns, the Truth Campaign, uh, the anti, which is the anti-smoking campaign, as probably many of you know. I, I'm not going to get into that one now, but trying to brand the notion of truth to deter young people, teenagers, from smoking. And then, of course, the famous red campaign, which branded a red, branded a color, uh, in service of AIDS in Africa and creating, in partnership with so many corporations, products and services that people could buy um, in order to support that work of AIDS, uh, of, of overcoming AIDS in Africa. So um, there are many ways in which brand principles can be employed for those of us trying to create social change. And I want to come back um, in closing to just this early idea of a brand as a relationship. And as I said, if you know how to build a human relationship, you actually do know how to build a brand relationship. But there are essentially these five steps I've learned over time. These are the five steps, whether it was a, uh, in the business world or in the nonprofit or the cultural world. Um, and it does start with um, excavating, and I use that term because you won't get to this easily. You have to dig it out, usually, and excavate an insight into the brand relationship. Um, as I said, it's very important that you're doing this among those who are most loyal so that you can replicate what makes that relationship so positive. Um, and then you have to understand and interpret that. You have to be able to answer this question, how are we significant in the lives of our users? Um, and, uh, and then distill that to its essence. And that may be almost the hardest part. I think as nonprofits, we often have so many wonderful things that we want to say that we're trying to do. It's quite important to be very disciplined about this and to um, uh, uh, bring out what is the essence or most essential and eliminate what is inessential as you try to build this strong uh, and coherent relationship. Uh, then, of course, that idea has to be expressed creatively, hopefully beautifully, and very consistently in all the touch points so that you can build the relationship in everything you do. You have to create a very coherent 360-degree relationship. It's not just about the communications. It is about the experience. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And um, now we'd just love to open it up for questions and discussion, to hear what's on your mind. And I'm going to try to open it. I can't see the chat uh, room right now, but so I'm going to see if I can open and get to that. Pull it up. 
Uh, we've got quite a few examples that have come in. I'm going to do a crazy thing right now, which is to unmute everybody to allow you to uh, each ask questions and so forth. We have a few comments. I was, I was making some notes as we went along through your course of your presentation, Cynthia. And um, I, I um, asked folks what sort of campaigns that they had, uh, brand, what sort of brand um, launches that they have. I had noted two examples myself. One of which I think is actually quite famous, which is the God is Still Speaking campaign that was in the United Church of Christ, which I think was just uh, shortened to say still speaking. You don't put a comma where, or you don't put a period where God uh, put a comma. And then within my own denomination, I'm at this church, we've had open doors, open hearts, and open minds, uh, which I've personally noted that a lot of people have just quickly sort of uh, pushed back against by saying closed doors, closed hearts, closed minds, when they have something that they disagree with that has to do with the church, unfortunately. So I think it opens itself up to um, a challenge. There's an example from the Episcopal Diocese of Ohio from uh, Susie Erty. Um, that is, uh, love God, love your neighbor, change the world. The Episcopal Church welcomes you. And Sarah uh, from the URI North America says that they're working on one now called Tangible Hope uh, to share stories of value-based collaboration to counter the hate and fear in mainstream um, media. And so they, they have that already up on their website. I was interested in kind of drawing out from people what some of their campaigns have been, uh, their, their brand initiatives, and um, uh, any questions that they had about going in. So we're going to go ahead and unmute everybody here. Dangerous. Uh, and see if you all have questions. Just please identify yourself, say who you are, where you're from, and then pose your question to Cynthia, if you would. Thank you. We have stunned silence. Yes, we have stunned silence. <laughs> Uh, I still have some uh, people that need to be unmuted. Sorry, I, okay. it didn't seem to work for everybody. Hang on here. Go ahead and ask uh, your questions. If you have one, identify yourself, what organization you're from, any questions you have about the presentation that she made or what it would take to make a, a brand initiative within your uh, shop. Hi, Bud. This is Sari from URI, and I, I came on a a little bit late, so I'm sorry if some of this was covered, but I think a question that we're always asking at small nonprofits is how do we make time for marketing? When you've got, you know, one person or two people who have every job, you know, in the whole organization kind of thing. Um, so I guess the question is, how have you found that, you know, to do more with less? Um, and what are the good arguments for actually making time to do this? That's a great question. How to do it in a small shop um, as opposed to having a big team. You, some of the organizations you've worked with have been quite large teams, Cynthia. Have you had the experience of working with people that are doing it in small shop settings? Um, uh, yeah, I, I have. I've, I've uh, worked with a small nonprofit theater. I've worked with uh, other smaller cultural institutions. Um, but I want to I wanna take the first uh, part of your question, which is sort of how do you make the case? And um, I think that actually this way of thinking about brands um, as a relationship and that it's about basic relationship building, um, it should be helpful to you because uh, in most organizations, uh, marketing may be sometimes set aside or separate from development. And I think it's very important that if we're going to actually raise uh, the money and the volunteer resources we need to do our work, um, it's just a different way of thinking about it. So part of the help, part of what helps I think is to frame it around relationship uh, building overall and that this becomes the foundation for that. Um, I will also say, and again, I know I had um, the benefit of working for the largest nonprofit, but one of the things that got people's attention there was to really um, think about the value of, of brands and their ability to attract revenue. And with the evidence that, um, uh, that, 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 you know, the brands have that kind of value and that even a nonprofit, uh, we eventually got to being able to demonstrate that a nonprofit. So I think some of you could even use the United Way example, the fact that it, you know, became, um, as, as we were more intentional about the way we built the brand, um, we're able to, um, to see it as a, uh, you know, as attracting more revenue and more resources to do the work. Because ultimately, you have to kind of follow the money. It's going to be about either the human or the, the, the capital resources you need to do your work. Um, then to your question about uh, how do you do it in a smaller shop? I mean, one is that, you know, you sure, certainly you do want to employ the 
volunteers as much as you can. Uh, I think it's very important to have a, a, a group of volunteer professionals. Most people who work in the marketing and, and um, uh, you know, the professional sector in the business world would love to help lend their expertise and to help you, uh, what we've just been talking about here, create more social good in the world with it. So you can bring around you a group of advisors and people that can bring resources in. I mean, while it is true that United Way has deep pockets, the advertising that we ran, we got $60 million of donated media support from the Ad Council um, by making the case there. So you can go to people who will run PSAs, you can go to people who will help create those um, messages for you, will help you create the brand, and will be part of your, uh, part of your core. Um, I also think that when, uh, you know, most of you um, have boards, and on your boards there usually are business people who do understand the power of brands and marketing, and if you can take some of the kind of thinking that I've been sharing today about how that applies to the work of the nonprofit sector um, and will, uh, will, will help in your ability to attract the resources you need to fulfill mission, um, I think that you, you, know, you want to make that case to those people who really get it and they can become your champions on your board and help you get, the res uh, get more resources. That's, that's great. Um, I have a few people who have muted themselves again uh, because they're in open office spaces or what have you, uh, but we have some additional questions that are coming in via the chat. The next one is from uh, Jay Snyder and it says, what are the biggest mistakes that you've seen or experienced uh, in doing a uh, brand? You, you talked about some of the steps along the way and you gave some examples of successes and so forth. Yeah. What, are, what are mistakes that people make in, in terms of the process of doing this? Uh, well, I think one of the mistakes that you can make, um, uh, and, and it was, I mentioned this at the very beginning, I think that oftentimes um, marketers uh, who particularly are trying to create, uh, trying to do some renovation or create some change uh, going forward, uh, they'll often do research among those people who are not contributing or supporting or involved. And while it can be important to have some understanding there, as I've said multiple times because I want to be sure it gets through, is the most important thing that you can do is to have the understanding of those who are loyal and supportive because then you can replicate that experience. So I would say one of the common mistakes is actually paying more attention to the people who have tried and rejected you and trying to answer their need rather than authentically understand who you are, where your strength is, and to build out from that strength. Um, so that is certainly one, uh, uh, one kind of common error, I think. Another one is, um, again, trusting this to just be communications. A lot of organizations, um, most organizations, even small ones, can be quite siloed. And building a brand is everybody's job. And so if it gets sequestered or siloed over into communication or marketing and you're there trying to do this, you, you can't succeed alone. It has to be, everyone has to understand that they are ambassadors of the brand, that building the brand is everyone's job. And I think, uh, in fact, it's, you're most successful um, as the brand architect inside an organization when you can convince the person at the top of your organization that he or she is the chief brand steward, that they actually are the ones that are most responsible for building the brand. And this is true whether we're talking, you know, uh, a religious organization, whether you're talking about your, your, your pastor, whether we're talking about a president of, uh, or executive director of a nonprofit. They have to embrace it and they have to be champions. And so one of the mistakes, again, that I've seen is to not understand that and to silo this off into, uh, sequestered into a corner um, where it can't possibly succeed. We got a great question here from Susie Erdy. Uh, she says, uh, we provide pension and other benefits to Episcopal clergy and lay employees. It's not terribly sexy, uh -huh, but it's a crucial service to the church. Uh, we really have no competition by virtue of canon law. That sounds so serious. Establishing CPG as the provider of pensions and health care. So how might we approach brand loyalty and messaging? Um, well, I wouldn't... Um I wouldn't be so presumptuous as to be able to really give you um, advice on the spot. Yeah. If what you're saying is when you look at this particular uh, group, I guess you're talking about um, the clergy as your, as your users in this case, um, you, would, you would follow the exact same uh, formula we've just been talking about. You would, you would go to those who are using it, who understand it, under, and, and know about it, because again, brand 
this yours might simply be an awareness issue and certainly there are times when awareness um, I mean you can't you can't create change if people aren't aware but I'm talking here about a deeper deepening of relationship and building sort of loyalty um, which is you know a step beyond basic awareness um, so if you don't have essential awareness you want to build that awareness at least in the greatest strength that you've got so understanding through a group of the clergy who are using it, who do understand and are favorable to it, um, how it's meaningful to them, what it means to them, use them as your advocates and use them as your base for the insight that you would build to then go ahead and figure out how you're going to brand this. I mean, you may need to look at what you call it. You may need to look at um, um, how you're reaching people. So does that mean you just simply, even if you felt your material is boring, if you will, that, that, that you're trying to deliver, it doesn't have the sexiness to it, as she had said in her language. Uh, you follow the same five steps, excavate, understand, distill, express, and then work to build a relationship. And the excavate process might start with, like say, a focus group of people who are benefiting from the pension and health benefits to understand what their own perceptions are of the services that are delivered to them and so forth, and it might end up in the very end with trying to look at every facet of how it is that you communicate with them. For example, what, what do they experience when they actually call in to ask questions? What, how is the phone answered? How, what's the signature on an email? Uh, how do they feel about and do they feel like they were listened to in the, co in the context of trying to ask their questions, that kind of thing on the other end of it? It's yeah. Same, same process, yeah. and they might discover something fun in between about um, uh, you know, how to describe it or, or what have you, right? Absolutely. And again, um, uh, as I'd said, you know, brand status is earned. Um, you, um, you're, you're not just automatically a brand because you put a, you've created a, a logo somewhere and you put a name on it. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, if your service has value, if, if, if what they're offering in this case, it may not be sexy to the world, but I bet it's very team. important to the people who are relying on it. So that's the thing. It can be significant in the lives of a smaller group of people, but for those people, it's probably pretty darn important. Well, one of the questions I have is, uh, personally, that I have is uh, how it is that you explain the difference between what is the brand for an organization and what might be like an individual campaign that you would uh, undergo? Because I, I'm not really necessarily understanding the distinction in some of these cases. Like you give the example of Live United, which is effectively part of a larger brand, which you would describe how, and then the Live United itself is a campaign within that brand to help basically give life to it. Uh, yes, and I think in that case, uh, they were completely integrated. I mean, fortunately, the name is United Way. So yeah. the campaign grew out of that idea. Uh, and so Live United and United Way, you know, are kind of intrinsically linked. Um, and we didn't really see them as separate. I mean, obviously, at some point, they could change the uh, campaign away from Live United and United Way brand would still be there. But I think it's in the same spirit that... Uh, again, if we'll go back to, you know, Nike, just do it. I mean, we all know, you know, that we know what the brand is. Um, that campaign is integrally um, embedded in our brains as, as expressing the brand value and the brand proposition in that particular case. So we are trying to do the same thing with Live United. Um, I think where you might see a difference, though, is you could have within a strong nonprofit brand, you could have a branded campaign around a particular program. Um, that would follow these same principles. And it might not, I mean, it would be maybe sponsored by the overarching institutional brand. Uh, we created something at uh, United Way called Born Learning, which was a campaign around um, um, zero to five uh, pre, uh, pre literacy language acquisition and how important that was. And we branded it uh, Born Learning and had a whole brand campaign. And that was sponsored by United Way as a brand. So you can create kind of sub brands. In fact, that's a very important part of understanding a brand a much more complex one that has maybe a series of sub brands that you need to also figure out how they ladder up and feed and halo into the um, understanding and the value of the overarching uh, institutional brand. So I, we've got a question that came in via uh, social media here. It's a person basically saying, um, I understand that, uh, that a slogan for an organization or a billboard that's on a highway should have no more than like five to seven words with it. And, and they're observing that you and many of the examples that you provided were providing something that's just a couple of words or a few words as a phrase, what have you. Do you need to have that as a centering or anchoring point? Um, and do you have a marker that you go for in terms of that uh, for the brand? Um, I wouldn't say um, that there's a 
the complete hard and fast rule, but you're absolutely right about the principle, um, which is that things that are, you know, short and memorable, I mean, you're trying to embed something in people's memory, you're trying to have meaning. Uh, if you can't recall the line, if it's such so long that you either can't read it when you drive past the billboard or you can't remember it. I mean, uh, I, I actually like to say that as human beings, I think we can only remember three things. Um, and so I always operate in the set of trilogies. So you'll see that even on that uh, United Way Rubik's Cube that we had, there were, there were only three goals. There were only three ways to take action. There were three ways to build a relationship. I mean, I know that's nine things overall, but I'm just saying that we think we remember and we can drive to three things. I think institutions can have three overarching goals of what they're trying to achieve and no more. People, we can't remember more than that. We can't hang on to more than that. So the same thing is true in the best communication, of course, is short and sweet is better. Um, of course, I did use the one ad council campaign, friends don't let friends drive drunk. That's not exactly three or four lines, but it's such a powerful idea. And, is, and it, I think that's a great example of creating a whole new social norm around behavior that previously maybe people wouldn't have ever dared or been empowered to, to challenge a friend and to take away their keys. And so that's a longer communication. It's a pretty a powerful thought and it was effectively communicated with that. So there's no hard and fast rule, but the principle of it, uh, as you've articulated is absolutely right. So our friends that asked the question back at the Episcopal Church Pension Group that think that they have a locked audience and a relatively uh, boring thing that they're delivering, they could come up with something that's interesting, like saying, it's your life, uh, take care of it, or some sort of phrase that would basically carry forward the central idea of what's crucial to the services that they're delivering. They're giving people pensions, health benefits, and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's about you know self-care. They might be able to develop something and discover in the midst of their focus group or what have you that they exercise what what might be an interesting or attractive brand yeah yes absolutely importantly though they don't want to guess about what that is they you you may think you know what why what something why something is important to people and and it's a little bit i will take a moment just to say it's it's not so simple because you can't just do a focus group and say okay tell me how are we significant in your lives you know, people can't answer that question really. So there's sort of a series of questions that I have as a brand audit that gets at emotional and intangible things. You ask people to tell you stories about the brand. You ask them to associate folklore, um, you know, what stories or folklore they associate. And you have to kind of ask a lot. You have to listen carefully because you can't, it's not a, it's not a question you could just ask and have answered. Um, because you're trying to get at these subtle kind of emotional things. And a lot of times people don't, you know, readily admit those or they're, they're not top of mind. They're more deeply embedded. And those are the things that are the most powerful are the ones that really are emotional and that kind of, um, that, again, like I said, you excavate out of this kind of series of discussions and research. Uh, sorry, I know that you uh, were on and, and I think you've uh, mu muted yourself, but you had uh, uplifted something you did at URI North America recently. You had a, a webinar on um, social media um, use, being used to build movements. Did you want to say something about that? Sure. Just I think that the idea of brand building in this day and age is obviously inextricably linked to social media. Um, and so we had some folks on um, who are doing that in a couple of different organizations talking about the role of social media and tips and tricks for using it um, and also that idea of it coupled with movement building and and how I think Cynthia we, we talked a lot about one of the things you've said which is like these are just regular real life relationship building skills you're just applying them in a different way mm -hmm. and, but I posted that link in the chat box if anyone's interested in checking that out and in the next day or so I'm also post on their toolkit with some of the resources and things that they provided so folks who are specifically interested in social media side of things you can check that out. Yeah, I, the one thing I was thinking about is that uh, the process you seem to be describing, Cynthia, seems like it's a long-term process in terms of the going through the steps and bringing so many different people along and getting the investment of the leadership of the institution. And the, the reality of the social media aspect of it is that it seems like it's so um, immediate. I, I realized when people were watching the recent uh, elections, the debates that were happening amidst them, people were inventing hashtags and there was, you know, trending of conversations, national conversations with literally, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people engaging around a hashtag that was created based on something that happened. Now, of course, they're doing that from the framing of whatever it is that their brand is or the thing that they want to have a discussion about, but it's like sort of real-time extensions of the, the brand. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I mean, and you, of course, in social media, you have to be very nimble, but it's important, as you said, the, 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 uh, and I'm, I'm not sure uh, the, the political, the, the political um, a example is a really difficult one because I, I'm not sure we've seen um, examples of great branding in this particular <laughs> particular uh, election. I mean, there, there are definitely brands out there, are two brands out there, but, uh, but uh, um, I think that uh, in, it, you have to start from the core strategy and even your social media, and certainly social media is not where you start. You, you, you have to understand all of these other things and then social media is one of the ways you execute. Um, and then you have to be nimble with how you interpret the brand, but um, I, I like to always say that you, if you come back, keep coming back to the strategy and what you're trying to accomplish. And so in many cases, again, for us with United Way, our touchstone was kind of, this is about change, not charity. And we could kind of use that brand as a touchstone so that if you were creating and, you know, and that Live United and about unity and then if, and, and trying to have discipline about only using a, a, a limited number of hashtags and bringing maybe multiple ideas, but back into those core ideas. Um, and I do think that, uh, that we're, social media can blow you off course if you're not careful. So you do want to be sure that you're employing the, the basics of, of the strategy. But I think to the point that was made, um, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad to see this posted, I'll look forward to looking at it. Social media is perhaps the most powerful way to engage with people and to do that part that I said is two way and listening. And so it's a very critical um, aspect of building the brand relationship. Yeah, one of the things I, I wonder about is if you've had experiences of situations uh, backfiring. I think just in the past couple of days, I've seen a lot of things on social media about the new um, Starbucks cups. You know, there was controversy about it yeah. last year that they removed some of the holiday uh, markings and so forth, and Christian groups uh, challenged it. This year, they've released one that's under the theme of unity, and it's green and white, and people are making anti-Islamic comments and saying that it's related to Islam, the, the cups. I do recall in the Super Bowl, um, uh, I think a couple of years ago, we had a commercial that was done by Coca-Cola that featured very, very diverse Americans, some of them in their religious uh, headdress and garb in the midst of the commercial, and it created some controversy after the fact. There were people who cleverly were ready to actually respond to that on social media and provided data to show how we're becoming a more religiously diverse nation and how that is actually reflective of our country and so forth. Mm -hmm. but I'm wondering about experiences you've had of sort of backfiring and what you do um, to actually take um, some you know, responsibility for that and challenge it. Uh, well, that's a really big question. Um, probably th that would be a great subject, actually, for a, d a dedicated uh, webinar, I think, um, about it, because uh, there are, I'm, I'm trying to think of immediate examples just within my own experience, and of course, all of us have, have had those where mm -hmm. um, things get either spin out of control or, um, or they're taken the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, and in this day and age, with feedback being so immediate, and, and at, at high volumes, it can be, as you pointed out a minute ago, it can be at very high volumes. Um, you do have to be uh, nimble and, and prepared, but your core strategy, both anticipating what those things might be, what could go wrong, this is a very important part of the strategy. You have to anticipate where something might go. And, and I'll, I'll say you know, that in my recent ex, uh, experience in uh, rebranding the Met, branding the museum, uh, we had um, some initial really negative responses to the new logo, to the new mark that went out onto social media. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, there, there, it can be very hard to contain that. And it did get picked up. And eventually, you know, we knew that our strategy was right. We knew that the core work was right. And sometimes the best answer is to let it just play out and flame out. And it'll kind of take care of itself. A lot of uh, social media stuff can be like a 24 hour cycle. Um, and you can kind of let it, uh, let it, let it flame out. I mean, our response was uh, to go ahead and execute the plan that we had. Uh, we stayed our course. We had many third party uh, folks coming out. We already had stories and articles in the works coming out about not just about the mark, but why we were making the change, what it represented. Um, and so I do think that um, you want to be careful, as I said, not to be blown off course. Um, um, and at the same time, be, be prepared to, and, and anticipate some of the things that can go wrong so that you can, can be responsive. I, I noticed in uh, several of these situations that I was trying to think of as an examples that the organization actually uh, went head on after what it is that was being challenged against them. They spoke back and provided information like the responses 
to the Super Bowl ad, uh, a lot of people took advantage of it and said, look, we are a religiously diverse America. Things have changed. Here's the difference. And they show basically a, a marker of, of a market difference between people who are uh, under 30 in the U.S. and people who are over 60, say, in terms of their understanding and their own reality of religious diversity within their uh, generation segment. Mm -hmm. uh, I really encourage people. Well, I just want to say, as you pointed out, they had to be prepared with that data. They anticipated that yeah. possibility and were really prepared so that they could come back quite rapidly in a non-defensive way, but in a factual way that was quite powerful. Yeah, the people at Public Religion Research Institute were already had a graphic ready that they threw up uh, immediately. Um, the, I'm going to read a comment here from Christy House. In the meantime, I want to encourage people who are on the phone but not joining us via chat so you haven't had the opportunity to pose questions to ask a question as well before we have to close out. Uh, Christy says, I'm struck by the point that we should be listening to our loyal members, our friends in the organizations, and surveys I've done of loyal readers, and she uh, works to do a major publication for uh, the church. I sometimes get pushback, uh, quote, those are older members. We want to hear from people who are younger, who are not members unquote. So excavation, that's a very important point, your first point about the steps, and we have to start with what is uh, known, not unknown necessarily. Yeah. Anybody that's on the phone and not able to pose their question via chat, want to speak up, identify yourself, and ask a question? Most people are joining by computer, just have a few that are joining by phone. Anybody else have any additional uh, questions before we close out uh, with Cynthia? Hey, it's been a great conversation with you today, Cynthia. Thank you for very much for taking the time. You have a tremendous amount of uh, life experience and expertise in this field, and uh, for you have taken uh, the time as you did to speak with us and ask questions. Uh, we're all very appreciative. Um, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Again, if you'd like to learn more about the Religion Communicators Council, you can visit our website at religioncommunicators.org. Uh, we have a major convention next year, annual convention, uh, March 30th to April 1st in Chicago. Look forward to seeing you there and hope you'll follow along with us. Thanks.